DJ Leroy, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too, Night Watchman. How have you been? Uh, great. How about yourself? Good, good. You know, uh, like I said, I'm, uh, of course, uh, dealing with the, the surge of good old uh, uh, COVID and seeing mm -hmm. when we can finally put it in our rearview mirror. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alas, it continues. Mm hmm you know, but well, while uh, we're looking in our rear view mirror today. We're going to go back further. We're going to go back into our history and genealogy. Wow. Are you serious? <laughs> Night Watchman? Really? Absolutely. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, I think I think I actually I think I'm ready for that. You know that? OK, I, I want to actually bring up some uh, folks of talking about uh, genealogy, talking about DNA, talking about history mm -hmm. and also its effect on our community. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Uh, first person, we, we affectionately, of course, refer to her as Mama. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is the noted author, playwright, radio and TV personality, who also has some fabulous, fabulous hot sauce featured at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. that, that can only be one person. You know who that could be. That's got to be the Bye, one. Higginson. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey. How lovely to be with you. It's oh, great boy. to have you here. We always love to hear your voice and see you, you know. Um, and uh, you've done, you're always into so many different things. So it's always a pleasure to have you on our show. That's right. A <laughs> Renaissance woman, indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, needless to say, uh, this next uh, person I'm going to bring up has become a, a fast and furious friend because, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, uh, she's actually related to our good friend, Audrey Sanders. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was originally born there in D.C., you know, or what we call Chocolate City. But he started the whole thing in terms of DNA investigation and turned out that Audrey is his cousin. I really want to find out about that journey. And that can uh, only be Elder Anthony Hunter. Bring him up. How are you, everyone? How are you? How are you doing, my brother? Doing well, doing well. Good, good. And I know you're right now you are in uh, Georgia itself right now, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Beautiful, beautiful. And and you know what? Uh, needless to say, Night Watchman, some other brother, not necessarily genealogist or one of these DNA experts, but you know what? He, he does it the old-fashioned way in terms of the research and investigation to be a serious historian. And, and he's actually, uh, Night Watchman, one of our own because he's a West Harlemite in the flesh. All right. The one, the only, Eric K. Washington. Bring him out. Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning, morning Eric. How you doing, buddy? Good, good. All right, all right. So, you know, I want to kind of like set up this uh, conversation. And remember, this is a conversation. And what did I tell you guys? I said, no Mike Wallace gotcha questions. This is going to be nice <laughs> and, uh, and friendly banter. So, you know what? I want to kind of like start it off because uh, by one of the things that kind of uh, caught my attention was a, I believe it was a 60 minute special where you were featured where uh, they uh, traced your DNA and your ancestry. It turns out that you have uh, uh, some white ranchers in Missouri. So please tell us about that. Oh, thank you, Curtis. Um, yes, that was quite a surprise. Um, I was, uh, after my grandmother died, who lived here, right here on 126th Street, um, we found some relatives that we didn't know about. And we had a family reunion and one of the elders, um, Reverend Jim West said to me, go find the others. And I took that really seriously. So I went on a search to find Robert and Mary West's mother and father and sister and brother. And the old fashioned way, of course, was through genealogy and, and papers. And it, we discovered that there weren't very many pa papers uh, left because of uh, the war and, and things burning down. So at any rate, we, I, I took a DNA test largely because I was always told in our family that our ancestors were Native American. And I heard that if you were more than 12% Native Americans, you were entitled to something. So I took the test. And it didn't, didn't have any Native American um, uh, DNA. 
it had European DNA. So we felt like we were living kind of a lie. Like, who are we? What is this all about? And that's what the search uh, came out. And we entered the first black family to enter this um, DNA project. And we entered this white family pedigree. And from there, the telephone began to ring. And I heard a guy say, hi, my name is uh, Marion West. I'm from Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and I'm a cattle rancher. And I hear we're related. We're relatives. We share a common ancestor. And that began the journey. We have yet to find the black cousins we have been looking for, still searching, but we have found many, 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 many hundreds of other uh, white cousins with the same common ancestor. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, serious. So I, I guess you know what? And Anthony, this almost speaks to uh, a certain thing that uh, Audrey had turned us on to. At first, she told us about the reluctance and actually taking a call from you. So I, I want to know, how did you finally get that side of the family to uh, to believe you that, hey, you're not asking for any money. You just want the connection <laughs> and to let them know that you're here to act, actually tell them about your side of the family and what you've discovered. Tell us. Well, persistence. Uh, again, I've been doing genealogy research and, and, and uh, reuniting some family members and uniting some other family members. But um, in that particular instance, I was very persistent. I called several times a day. Um, one, because I knew I was dealing with some older relatives. And a lot of times older people tend not to uh, answer their phones for calls they don't know. And so my strategy is if I call over and over again, they'll discover that maybe this is an emergency or maybe this is something serious. So uh, I did that and ironically, and this is only but God because Audrey was not, Audrey doesn't live there. She lives in New York. So for her to be there, uh, for that few days, she actually served a purpose, if you will. Uh, and there was some reluctance. Uh, but again, I've been doing this 20 plus years. I've heard it all. Um, people would oftentimes not answer the phone or answer the phone and then hang up. Um, and then later down the road, they'll discover that I'm an authentic person, right? Discovering uh, the relationship. And so in that instance, she then sat and we talked for hours. Um, and, and the crazy part about it is for us to be so close yet so far, uh, her great grandfather was or is my great great grandfather. Um, and so she was really taken back by the connection uh, and the crazy part about it is I am one of the only ones um, that are still living who even knows about this great, great grandfather. Um, but I did through research, find a birth certificate, uh, which listed his name. So that gave me the confirmation that I needed to, to make that call. Beautiful. So, <laughs> Anthony, how many, how many family members have you located in your, in your genealogy journey? How much time do we have? I, uh, <laughs> a, a rough I have a family tree, uh, which consists of over 2000 names. Um, wow. and wow. I, it's still growing. I'm still adding names every day. Thanks to, uh, ancestry family tree maker. There's a database that I own that, you know, I paid for, of course, but I own, and I just on a daily basis add names to it. Um, and, and I've even discovered some family members, who I would sit down literally with the husband to fill in his offspring. And as I'm doing that, discover that his wife is on the same tree, just a little distant from him. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how history has divided us for so many years. Um, and as African-Americans being able to come back together uh, through a lot of the research. When I first started, I had to start with papers, literally 
spending countless hours at the archives in Washington, D.C., combing through microfilm and microfiche and all of these other resources that they had. And since then, again, 20 plus years later, they now have Ancestry and Heritage Quest and the, the list goes on with all the resources. Gotcha. I want to know, I want to know about literally Boss of the Grips, your history journey in terms of doing that investigative stuff. Because certainly I do know uh, as a person here with uh, New York City history and how important the red caps were to really, uh, let's say, move, moving not only uh, uh, people, but commerce. And, and really, and the rail system was in, in, in so important to an island like Manhattan. So do tell us your investigative history report. Sure. So my book was a, a biography. So I, I focused on one man from a, a big family and an important uh, figure in Harlem uh, during his period. I didn't have um, a DNA trail to follow, but in in my case, it was is it was basically building some kind of context for the family. I had the benefit of one family member, a great grandson of my project, who was uh, the repository for the family of of, of uh, all the photos and things like that. Much of which, you know, they didn't really know who they were or where the shot was taken. So part of my um, my mission was to make the connections and make them make sense. So uh, I did a lot of uh, plumbing uh, through beta newspaper databases, um, newspaper archives, uh, where I was able to locate uh, an event or the name of somebody else who was in a photo and they could say, oh, that was um, you know, Aunt Gertrude. Um, and I could say, well, the person that she's with on this beach in Virginia um, in the entourage of actress Florence Mills um, happened on this date and this was the lodge where they were staying. And that way, in that, in that sort of way, I was able to kind of build up uh, connections that um, hopefully the family will be able to use farther down the line. Uh, one of the rewarding things um, was that when the book came out and many of the family members came to hear me um, talk about it at the Schomburg, um, it said, you know, you know, we knew something about, you know, this person. We knew that he was, they knew more about the grandfather. I wrote about the grandfather's father. Um, and so they kind of knew that he, they knew he was a red cap. They didn't know exactly what that meant because most of them, you know, most of us don't know about red caps so much anymore because it was a generational, you know, separation from from that era. Um, so they knew that he was somebody because they were told he was somebody, but they didn't really have a context to know why he was important and um, and and all of the other connections between um, himself, his parents who had, were formerly enslaved, um, and all of that sort of important backstory so that if they're going to uh, follow a DNA trail, they're able to have some kind of context to put around it and, and, and keep constantly making connections. Hmm. So, uh, so Vi, uh, uh, I, I need to know, let's say, after making the connection with the, these uh, white uh, ancestors, uh, let's say, and, and relatives in uh, Missouri. Uh, what has the uh, relationship been? Have they traveled to New York to meet you to see the what you've done in terms of your life with the Mama Foundation and such? Well, yes. You know, it was quite an experience, and it was in the very early days of the DNA. So when... Um, the New York Times picked up the article because my grandmother's name was Anna West. So when Marion West came to New York, they took a photograph of that. That was in the New York Times. We're going all the way back now to like 2007 or so. And then um, the Today Show and NBC Nightly News and then CBS 60 Minutes and Oprah Winfrey and everyone was telling this, you know, began to talk about this DNA story and how genealogy or DNA had brought these families together. The thing is that this family was very embracing. Um, they wanted to know more. They were genealogists. 
and they couldn't find their way back to Virginia. So they were in Kentucky and Tennessee and, um, uh, you know, far west. And the black folks stayed in Virginia. So they were able now to be able to pick up some of the pieces of their heritage going back to uh, Virginia because we shared this common ancestor. And yes, we had many family reunions um, up until last year when the pandemic, and then we had virtual family reunions and we got to know most of you know the relatives and their children and their grandchildren and et cetera. So um, it was, you know, I didn't want to go to Missouri because I was a little bit scared. Uh, so I did take a camera crew with me and they captured because I didn't think I would be able to tell anybody what would happen when we got there. But um, since they were Democrats uh, among the few in Missouri, <laughs> it really was warm and, and welcoming. And so, um, yeah, we didn't see a lot of pickup trucks. It was, uh, you know, it's been a, a to this day, we continue to get together and talk and share stories and share times. As a matter of fact, a group of them came to New York and we went on the boat for Inez Dickens for her mm -hmm. birthday party and they had a ball. So yeah, we go back and forth. Oh, gosh, you're beautiful, beautiful. Uh, uh, so Anthony, do, do tell us, A, uh, well, have there been some, let's say some interesting facts that you've been able to uncover in your journey, your search? Well, I have um, at least five of the lines that I've discovered uh, that are um, Caucasian, if you will. Um, and, and there has been some very interesting stories. So one of the uh, lines come out of uh, South Carolina. And I recall just doing research and finding relatives again, uh, touching base with a lady who was in her 80s. She's since passed on. Um, but when I spoke with her, she was the uh, great niece to one of my ancestors who was a white man uh, out of South Carolina. And so when I spoke to her, I had asked her uh, if uh, by chance, uh, I believe he was my third great grandfather, by chance if he had any children. Now I knew he did, I was just trying to confirm with what she had knowledge of. And because they are uh, Caucasian, you know, it's, you wanna tread lightly. Um, and so I asked her that question and she said, well, I was told that uh, through family history that he had three black sons. And I almost choked at that point because the, of the way she said it, but then the fact that it was confirmation. Uh, my second great grandfather was one of those uh, uh, black sons. Uh, and so as I spoke to her and she was uh, very welcoming. Uh, and we just talked for hours uh, about him uh, based on what she knew as a little girl uh, in South Carolina. And then on top of that, uh, after meeting her and talking with her for years, I used to check on her at least once a year. Uh, it got to a point where I did a little more research on him and discovered his will, uh, which he left pretty much everything to his daughter and his daughter's mother, who were also black. I had no knowledge of him having any other children. Uh, she apparently, the daughter, ended up marrying a Pullman porter and moving to Canada. Uh, and so I have not yet been able to touch base with any of the offspring from that line, um, but it's been very interesting. And going back to the story of Audrey, that particular line, although I have been able to touch base with some of them, uh, have not been very receptive. And I think just because of the lack of knowledge. Um, so. It's, it's been very difficult uh, because it is in Canada, but um, I'm still looking. And like I said, there are like four or five other lines that I have five, uh, uh, I have white ancestors. So it's been interesting. 
Now you've also been able, you've also been able to trace your um your heritage back to Africa. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, your 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 journey to Nigeria, both genealogically and physically. Well, so I have not been able to yet discover people in Nigeria that I'm related to. Uh, however, uh, of course, with the DNA testing, uh, it, it gives you a percentage of your bloodline. Uh, and it said that I was 40 percent Nigerian, which is funny because uh my daughter uh who has since passed uh when she was sick she had a home health aide who was nigerian and she came to us i want to say about nine years ago um and when she came in she took to us like we had known each other all our lives um she had just talked to me for hours about her culture um the country as a whole and so I just on a whim decided I'm going to Nigeria. I want to see it for myself. Uh, and this was even before the DNA testing. Uh, and so I ended up going and they could not tell me that I was not Nigerian. I even started speaking with the dialect and trying to learn the language. Um, which tribe, I'm not sure just yet. Of course, there are, are, are multiple uh, Igbo being one of the major tribes in Nigeria, uh, Yoruba being another one. Uh, but I have been there about four different times thus far, uh, and I enjoy it every time I go. Uh, Eric, uh, Anthony mentioned Pullman Porters. Uh, please uh, uh, tell me a little of the, the history of Red Caps also and and how that they were a significant part in terms of the industrial revolution and, and certainly uh someone having that type of job as a, a red cap they were a significant player because they you know the wages were good and you almost got a, a chance to to see the country uh, as you speak and uh, very very vital to the movement of, of people in uh, new york city tell us about that yeah so the, the, the pullman porters and the red caps um, they were kindred uh, workers in, in terms of being both African-American. Um, the, sh the, the short form is that the, the, the Pullman porters rode the rails, the red caps worked the stations. Um, and often they would interact because you might have people in the family who were, you know, if you were a red cap who was a Pullman porter or vice versa, or there were red caps who became Pullman porters, Pullman porters who became red caps. Uh, the Pullman porters was an older group that had started right after uh, the end of slavery. Uh, Red Caps formed in the 1890s uh, among uh, at Grand Central uh, Terminal in New York uh, as an old white workforce. It was very successful, but um, one of the criteria was that uh, they be at least bilingual uh, to kind of be able to be able to address the polyglot society that New York was. Um, if you had language skills you, and you were white, you had other opportunities available to you. So that didn't last very long. So in about eight years, 1903, they decided to integrate it with James Williams, the subject of my biography. And within a year, the entire force was, was black. Um, but that was the essential difference between the, 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 the Pullman Porters and the Red Caps. The Red Caps worked the stations, but it caught on in railroad stations ac across the country almost immediately. And the, the forces pretty much, not unanimously, but uh, predominantly were African-American across the country. Um, one of the things that was uh, interesting, and as uh, Elder mentioned, uh, um, his relative who had married a Pullman porter and moved on, is that it was one of those jobs that gave you that kind of mo physical mobility um, because you could ride the rails for free. So you could relocate or just vacation or travel uh, for free, um, but also gave you a mobility because you were interacting with the public Constantly, that was part of your job. It was, it was, it was hospitality, uh, in a way. It was rough, but it was, but it was that. So you were constantly exposed to people of different backgrounds and, and different options. And um, you, one of the, one of the things that my guy was uh, James Williams was noted for was particularly hiring young black uh, college men who came from up and down the Eastern Seaboard 
uh, to New York during the summertime or during holiday vacations uh, to to do this lug work, you know, carrying other people's baggage uh, in order to make money to defray their their school costs so they could stay in school. And many of them became famous names uh, that we still know today, like Paul Robeson, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Um, there was a Broadway star I'm researching right now, Richard Huey. Um, but there were clerics, doctors, lawyers, educators, people from every brand, every field of um, of, of, of industry and work that you can imagine, who did work as you know in these in these grunt jobs as as, as red caps. Um, it's kind of interesting in terms of the genealogy uh, as we've been talking about uh, finding uh, when, when you when I'm looking at these people in the process of writing the book, um, I'm looking very often at uh, at census records and seeing. Um, it's not just making the connections, but seeing what they did, uh, what kind of work they were doing, uh, the buildings that they were living in, who were the neighbors, uh, how they were identified as black or mulatto or colored, um, and how that might have different on different censuses because the censuses are not are not um, they're not foolproof. Uh, they they can change subtly or drastically depending on which one you're looking at and who's reporting to the census taker. So all of those things are, kind of contribute to giving you a. a a lot to play with in terms of trying to uh, spin a thread uh, in genealogy of, of, of who your connections are and what their interests were and where they travel, where they moved to or where they stayed. Um, and it's, 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 quite, it's quite fascinating. So the process of writing this book with, you know, opened up a lot of um, uh, interesting channels uh, for, for me in terms of both the genealogy question, but just you know the immediate social question in terms of Harlem history. Eric, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, just your initial journey into being interested in in studying history? Because I, I noticed with all of us, there's a common theme of discovery, um, and I think it's not just us, but just um, you know black people in America in general have been dealt with the erasure. Of our history and our and our background, and I feel like we all have this um, this um, thirst to know more, and and we go on these these journeys of discovery, and and you, you're you know you're considered a historian. I'm not a historian, but I love history, and I've learned more about history since I left school than I ever learned in school. So I wanted to, you to start by telling us a little bit about you know, how you got involved in history and, 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 you know, just your journey into looking back in the past and what you found. I don't know when the absolute moment, was, you know, epiphany, where oh, I like history when that happened. But mm -hmm. I know I was born in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in my formative years on Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And I, as a kid, I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> it was just, I think I always knew I needed to be in the city. But one of the things in school, you know, that you, you, you don't learn about so much and mm -hmm. a lot of it is local history. So I think I grew up like a lot of kids thinking, oh, nothing ever happens here in my neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't until I was an adult and I was doing journalism, journalist assignments. Mm -hmm. um, I had by accident um, an assignment that had a, it was a lo local history component. And it involved uh, Seneca Village and uh, Sandy Ground, which was a free black community on Staten Island. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm from Staten Island. I never knew about this. And it changed my perspective. I realized immediately this, nobody doesn't have history. And mm -hmm. wherever you go, um, you're going to find something. But I think that compounded with, there, there was sort of a, a big moment, I think for a lot of people, 1991, when they rediscovered the African burial ground um, in Lower Manhattan, I think um, that event triggered an interest in a lot of people in looking into their attics, looking into the basements, looking into the back of their closets, looking around their neighborhood uh, to see uh, what might be lying dormant there of, of some significance that they'd been overlooking for a long time. And I think that's a, it, it's been a great way for people to kind of find their own interest, starting with like your family stories. Um, you know, where did, you know, where did grandma come from and who, you know, when did she get married or, um, you know, how did she end up there from Barbados, like, like mine, you know, how did she end up in New York and uh, where was she living when she got here? Um, and then you're, you're not, because inevitably 
when you're tracing those stories, you're awakening other questions uh, to be answered. So I think it was, you know, I, to answer your question, I, it, there wasn't like a, an immediate moment where I realized I was interested in history, but I think the more I tasted of it, the bigger my appetite became for it um, and the greater my hunger for finding out more um, because every question leads to not necessarily an answer, um, but more questions. <laughs> And uh, my grandmother's from Barbados also, so who knows? We might have some we might be <laughs> ancestry as well. And um, my own personal history, um, after my uh, dad died, uh, going through his papers, I was able to find... Um, so my great-grandmother brought bought a brownstone here in Harlem in 1924. And, um, and I found the mortgage. <laughs> and that was just really a great, you know, it was like, wow, how did this Bayesian woman, you know, immigrant, you know, with who had the foresight and 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 was able to make it happen that she's, you know, buying buying a house, you know, in 1924. So um there's so much that we have to gain when we connect to these stories. It's 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 really quite interesting. Vi, tell us a little bit about where did you start your journey in terms of looking looking back? I, I, I really got to jump in here because yeah, I heard do. the word Barbados, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I heard, brown, I, said, I heard brownstone in Harlem. So I, I don't know, but my father was from Barbados. Okay. And he, and he came to Harlem. <clears throat> in the early 1900s. And they, I think whatever happened in Barbados, they seem to have a knack for wanting to have a piece of property. Property was, you know, very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to jump in there. So is there three people on this line talking <laughs> about genealogy that's from Barbados? Did I get yes, that right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Me, uh, Eric, and, uh, and you. <laughs> So we could wow. all be related. <laughs> we could all be related. Yes. I do have a little piece of story. May I may I yeah, share please. this? Because it just happened about three days ago. And mm -hmm. we're talking about history. And mm -hmm. I think history really, American history really comes alive when we study our genealogy. And you know, mm -hmm. the secrets that we kept and the secrets that were kept from us, so that we really didn't know who we, you know, who we are or or how we were interconnected. Mm -hmm. And so in studying this genealogy, I got a call from a woman named Nicole. She said, I've been researching my, my husband's genealogy and you and your family have come through and your uh, grandfather, uh, your, your great grandfather, Robert West, and his father-in-law, Robert Clayton, sued Mickleberry Young, one of the biggest plantation uh, owners in Virginia, for back wages. And she found the paperwork. And I thought, oh my God, wow. can you believe that some, they had the courage to, to sue the plantation owner because they worked for a year and at the end of the year, Mickleberry Young refused to pay them and they went to court and everything is listed in the dialogue in the history of this plantation owner who refused to pay and Robert Young and Robert Clayton won a judgment against the slave owner. Now, whether they ever got paid, I don't know, but I just thought that that little piece of history felt so uh, empowering in a sense that they were able to stand up against the odds, I guess. Anyway, so that just happened a week ago, clearly out of clear blue sky, out of somebody that I didn't know. And I was so appreciative. And she had all the paperwork to back it up. And uh, it was just a great moment well, of history for me. To me, that, that talks about the issue of agency, because a lot of the watered down, filtered version of history that we get, it's like, well... Um, we were slaves, and then Lincoln freed the slaves, the end. And they never talk about 
what we did to fight against it, what we did, all of the all of the means that we employed, including the law. Think about Amistad. You know the ship that they they, they sued for freedom. You think about uh, Sojourner Truth, who lost her. Um, after Soda Junior Truth, who walked away from slavery, she didn't run, she walked, but she left her family behind. And after um, uh, slavery was abolished in New York, she went back to get her son, but her son had been sold into slavery down south. But Sojourner sued and got her son back. So, ah. you know, these stories about us um, using the law using any means necessary you know the the history of our agency is so important and it's always been removed and uh and that's that's the the power of discovery that we have when we go this, back and we start to learn what really happened it's right. like wow you know yes 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 uh, uh night watchman i have to give you major props for being my co-host because as, as you can see i've been coming in and out of the conversation so you know what i'm enjoying the conversation from the spanish mm -hmm. so <laughs> i mean i i want to hear from uh elder anthony in terms of uh, uh the development of the school that I want to, before I get to that, if I may, I want to, I want to kind of piggyback on on a couple of things that have been said already. Um, as, as one thing that I think that we miss all the time, and and since I've been doing this research, uh, and 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 not only with my own family, but even helping other people, um, because a lot of people have no knowledge of where to begin. Um, and so as I start helping them discover themselves, discover their ancestry, um, I'm reminded of the time where our ancestors were sold off from each other, literally having to fight to stay together. Uh, and so to now be in this day and time where we have a lot of family members uh, especially in my family, there are a lot of family members who are not as interested uh, in in family history, um, just because it's people are so far removed from the time period uh, of slavery, and so you know there's really not much of an interest. So it, it excites me to be on this line with you all and and to be talking about the many people. And I think uh, we talked about it before offline, but I think even thinking about Alex Haley and when he released Roots, uh, that sort of triggered a lot of people to want to know more. Um, but I've discovered so many relatives uh, who have done some tremendously amazing things uh, in the course of this history uh, here in America. And I mean, from education, um, I just lost a relative that I, I, I met through my research, uh, Dr. Penny Perry out of North Carolina. Uh, she was a librarian at uh, North Carolina Central University for many years. A uh, tremendous woman died in her late 90s. Uh, and I went and sat with her. See, a lot of my, my effort in rediscovering my family and rediscovering my family history is me physically moving from state to state, going to visit other people, uh, going to um, different state archives, uh, trying to uh, discover more information. Um, I'm just in awe of genealogy and history, African-American history to be specific. I mean, we can watch a lot of different movies and shows on uh, of different people in African American history, but when it comes to your own, there's something amazing that happens to my heart when I can discover an aunt or a, 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 a uncle who did something amazing. I know my great grandmother on my father's side uh, was born in 1885, died in 1949, uh, but in that course of her life, she discovered 
to become a, a stenographer, which was totally unheard of at that time. Um, and she was a real estate agent on owned tons of property in the city of Washington, DC. Um, and many other things. I mean, she was a lawyer for God's sakes. I mean, she was an amazing woman who came from Virginia and decided that come hell or high water, she was going to be educated and was going to educate her children. Uh, and that's what led me to the idea or the plan uh, that I've prayed over to establish a school, Dreamers Academy School of the Arts. And I, my family has believed in education for so many years. Uh, and so I want to be able to give back to uh, the future generations of students uh, where we are preparing this boarding school, providing them a safe place to uh, reside while they're receiving their education. We're teaching them life skills, but I am very passionate about the arts and that's uh, performing arts, which I've studied. Um, uh, also, I studied technical arts, carpentry, plumbing, electrical wiring, uh, brick masonry. And so we have an array of, of, of arts that we're going to be teaching our students. Uh, and so we're just in the beginning stages, but I believe that God is in the midst of it all. So I'm super excited about that. Uh, I, I hear you. And, and you know what? One of the things that I, I was saying. Uh, so um, Curtis will be back in a second. Um, I think we would be remiss if we also didn't talk about what's been happening recently with the attack on black history, whether it was the pushback that Nicole Hannah Jones have received for her 1619 project or this, um, this uh, sham that has come up with the critical race theory where that's being used as an excuse to uh, eliminate the teaching of, of the true history of this country. So I, I think we've, we've stumbled upon something that this um, our search for history is like a, it's like a power cord. It's like a hidden power line that when we plug into it, we find so much uh, access to resources. Uh, um, and I just see uh, the transformative nature of us finding and connecting to our history. Totally, totally. And, and I was absolutely, uh, as you said, discovering the extraordinary things that our ancestors or relatives have done despite the odds, despite of those odds that they uh, accomplished. I told you, that, uh, Anthony, about my Uncle Cecil Pearl, a Tuskegee Airman, who then after um, serving World War II, uh, wanted to actually get a job uh, working for Pan Am Airlines, which is uh, no more. But at the time, he could not. So he ended up doing uh, what a lot of veterans did, and that's working the civil service. And my uncle uh, ended up working in the post office for many years, raising three children, buying a home in Southeast Queens. And, and that's probably the story of a no number of brave African-American uh, veterans who uh, served uh, their country uh, proudly. Yeah, so I mean, I hope that we can uh, pass some of this um, desire to look back to uh, some of our younger generations who I believe are cut off from it. Um, and their perspective of history is history that, I mean, we all, we've all been privileged to watch a lot of history, even from the time we were born to now, um, you know, all the, uh, the, the turmoil from the 60s on up and and then so many things that were discovered since then. Eric mentioned um, uh, Seneca Village, which uh, was an amazing find. And we never heard about Seneca Village when we were in, 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 in high school or even college. I'd never heard a word about it until, you know, maybe the last 10 or 15 years. It's like, oh, my God. And then, you know, my own search to, to find out more about it um, Seneca Village was uh, amazing because it was one of the first places where um, Black New Yorkers who were freed in 
1827, but really couldn't vote if you didn't own land. And so Seneca Village was a big parcel that was sold out. It was a white landowner who started dividing it up and had no problem selling to black people. So it, 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 it quickly became a place where people could not only um, own land and have a separate community. So Seneca Village predates Harlem. Um, it existed around the same time as the Five Points area downtown where there were uh, um, a significant black presence. And I think there was also significant black presence in the West Side area they called the Tenderloin District. So, um, you know, the more we look back, the more we see the excellence that got re uh, erased. And, and I think it's affected us because there's so many of us who have a, um, a self-image of themselves that is based on a narrative that's so false. And um, please, anyone, if they've, you've got uh, some opinions on this, please feel free to join in. Bob, I think that's a, a good point. It, it just reminds me that part of that self-image that many of us have as New Yorkers, as Black New Yorkers, um, is that Harlem is Harlem is Black, and that's that's where all the only place where we've ever been. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of um, what I constantly come across in in, in research is uh, particularly James Williams was that. He started out in what was known as the Tenderloin, which is now mm -hmm. called, called Kelsey. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of other New Yorkers, he was one of the first turn of a wave of African Americans moving up, up to Harlem. Um, I think after these kinds of conversations, people often want to know how do I how do I get started because it seems like there's so much out out there. And mm -hmm. I always like to say, you know, start locally. If you've been here, say, a few a few generations deep, maybe go to the library uh, or to the municipal archives and look at census records at uh, try to find the address where your grandparents first located um it may well be that they weren't in harlem they were in a, another area and you'll say why were they there i always thought we were from harlem you know, and you'll start to put together maybe a trajectory or see who their neighbors were or like oh their neighbor was this relative you know i didn't we heard about her we didn't know that they, that you know she lived with them or um what kind of work they were doing i always thought that she was um uh uh you know, a teacher, but says that she was a laundress, you know, um, which doesn't mean that she couldn't have been both. So uh, it just generates a lot of questions. And it's an easy place for people to start, just start locally, start with your building, the building you live in, you know, because um, invariably it's going to, to um, be a springboard for your wanting to seek more information and starting to put together pieces of a puzzle um, to create a bigger picture. And also, I guess the... Um uh talk to our elders while we still got them and get the right. stories and and some of them have the documents and uh I, i'm laughing because i see um we have elder anthony hunter here who's the youngest person on our panel. <laughs> <Elder. laughs> but, but but what you will find and what we have found is that we slowly become um the the the, the more senior members of our family whether we like it or not and so if we have people more senior than us, we, we, we need to um, get to them and hopefully get to them when they still have, you know, uh, cognitive uh, functions. You know, um, it was, you know, my, my dad who passed in 2014, but he, he suffered from dementia. So, you know, his last few years, we weren't able to really get stories out of him but it was going through the paperwork afterwards where we we, we kind of found some of the history uh, of the property and um, and uh, and the, and those records we had some um, marriage certificates and birth certificates and those can be so instructive um, and, and enlightening I, I do want to say this that in in the years of researching, I will always tell people to start with what you know, whatever that is, just make notes of it because you don't want to discredit anything unless you have documentation to show something else. Um, the other part of it is maintain an open mind to whatever. Don't leave no stone unturned because again, going back to what Mr. Washington just mentioned, you may have thought that she was 
a lawyer, but she was a laundress. You know, you just don't know. And then you also have to understand the time frame of where you're looking. The census records were done every 10 years, but it is only released to the public for view every 70 years. So right now we're up to 1940 as to what we are able to view for our records. Um, so we have to wait, I believe, I can't even tell you what year it is, but it's gonna, because they just recently, uh, maybe about five or 10 years ago, released the, the 1940. Uh, and so you have to wait a long time before you can even see the 1950. Uh, one thing that I know is that a lot of, in my family, a lot of the older people, they either don't know or they don't want to talk about it because it may open Pandora's box of some untold stories <laughs> that they don't want to get out, you know, um, one thing that I've discovered in my my history with this researching is that everybody has a story. And I think Ms. Vi had talked about that earlier, but everybody has a story. And with everybody having a story, everybody's story is not going to be the best taste in the mouth. And so you have to tread lightly when digging up people's dirt, right? Because <laughs> essentially that's what you're doing. It's a puzzle that you know, if these people aren't deceased that you're looking for, you're going to run into some stuff that, you know, I've, I've, I study death certificates. I study them because one, I want to know in my family history, especially with my ancestors, what are these people dying from? Hypertension, high blood pressure. I discovered a death certificate the other day and it blew my mind. In 1939, a cousin of mine died from gonorrhea, what we know to be an STD. But in 1939, gonorrhea was taboo. It was not the most common thing. And therefore, the medical industry, I mean, they didn't know what to do with it. So people died. My great great grandmother, she gave birth to a child and the child died because her breast milk was not sufficient enough for that child to eat. So you're looking at all these death certificates and you're discovering all these people who are dying and how they're dying. It's interesting. And again, some of this stuff people don't want to get out. So yes. by uh, you actually um took your family history and turned it into uh, a play, a foundation, uh, uh, a, a total, total phenomenon. So tell us a little bit more about the, 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 the mama journey. No, oh, yes, the mama journey. Well, you know, it starts right here on 126th Street between Lenox and 7th, facing the state office building. And so uh, it starts with Reverend Randolph Higginson from Barbados, who was the minister of a church for a famous woman by the name of Mother Horn on Lenox Avenue and 130th Street. And he died in the pulpit preaching a sermon. And the sermon to his parishioners was Ephesians 4 and 1. I, therefore, servant of the Lord, beseech ye to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. When I found that out, that began the journey and the attempt to fulfill his mission of walking worthy. When I graduated from college, my sister took me with her to London, England. Doris Troy won amateur night at the Apollo Theater. She wrote a song called Just One Look. That's all it took. It became a pop soul classic. It stayed in the charts in the top 10 for months and months. And so it was a crossover sound. And she was the it girl of that time. And we have all of these archives. But when I went with her, she told me stories about the family and my father and who he was and how she felt about it. And that began the journey of knowing about my father because I was an infant when he died. My mother had four kids that she had to raise under 10 years old. 
and she turned that house into a rooming house, the one that we are in now. So, and and that's the stories that I grew up with, the food and the music and Doris Troy, you know, without a father, she was a rebel and she traveled and she went and, and I got to see behind the scenes. And so when I came back, I really had to tell this story because it wasn't only our story. It's the story of African-American music in this country. And it, it's the story of our ancestors. And I tell our young people that they are survivors. They are the best of the best. They are survivors of slavery. And therefore we have you know, a duty and a responsibility to learn our history, to know who we are, where we come from. And especially I dedicated it to music because we can't not look at our music and take it for granted. It is a major contribution to the American musical landscape. It is a healer, it is a confidence builder, it is a romancer. Our lyrics, our sound of our human voice, it, it bar none, and it's an authentic art form. And, and so that's how I became completely dedicated after telling this story of mama, I want to sing, which is a metaphor for everything. We want to be something, we want to do something. We want, we have a talent, we have a gift and we want to share that gift and that talent. We want to be recognized, we want to be seen, we want to be acknowledged and appreciated. And music is where, you know, so the Mama Foundation for the Arts is the outgrowth of mama, I want to sing. And so therefore I felt it was my responsibility to come back, to give back, and to gather these young people between 11 and 19 years old and feed them the music, feed them the lyrics, to give them a toolkit so they can survive and, and, and thrive in a country like this. And so it's music, but it's also a leadership program. And 87% of our kids go on to higher education or careers in the music. So I'm really passionate about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about their confidence and their self-esteem because in fact, they are the future leaders of America. We're turning this country over to these young people and they must have skills and tool sets. And they have to know who they are and where they come from and why you know, we are survivors and, and how we did it. Amen to that. So um, we're at the end about this show. Um, it's really been great. Thank you all um, for your yes. for your experiences, for your what you shared, your perspective. Um, I, I, I'm just thrilled that we had a chance to have this conversation together. Uh, DJ Leroy, would you like to add yes. any parting words? Uh, well, uh, the, the ancestors, despite the te technical difficulties, allowed us to plow through. So I'm very, very happy, excited, and, and Lord knows, uh, each of you, uh, you're going to let me know about any future endeavors that uh, uh, that you wish to share on Soul Lounge Primetime, please. So you've been listening to Soul Lounge Primetime. We air on WACR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. You can also find us on the Soul Lounge Primetime YouTube channel and the Soul Lounge Primetime Facebook page and uh, we always air on Monday nights on the radio at 7 p.m. and online at 8 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Thank you our, our guests and we will see you all again 